Africa Strategies Program uh, event that is being co-hosted here with the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Um, and just before I do hand over to Phil and welcome you, I would also like to recognize at the back of the room, uh, Laura Friedman of Americans for Peace Now. Obviously, Americans for Peace Now has a has a very close relationship with the uh, with Shalom Achshav, with Peace Now in Israel, whom um, Chagit Ofran represents. Uh, Chagit is here doing some uh, some meetings for um, actually on campus. Chagit has been doing a campus tour and also doing some meetings here in Washington that Americans for Peace Now have been putting together. Those have been uh, more discreet, uh, private uh, uh, meetings. So this is the 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 public. Uh, opportunity to uh, to get to listen to uh, to Chagit at the New America Foundation. I'm sure I can speak for the Foundation for Middle East Peace as well. That we're delighted uh, to be able to host this event. Ambassador Phil Wilcox, Foundation for Middle East Peace, was the Consul General in East Jerusalem and a man who uh, those of you who who follow these issues, I'm sure, will be very familiar with and, and will probably admire as much as I do. Phil, please. Thank you, Daniel, and welcome. We're Delighted to co-sponsor this event with the New America Foundation, uh, and uh, very pleased to have uh, a person who is surely one of the world's leading experts on a problem which uh, our foundation has a keen interest in. Also, the uh, some 20 years ago, the Foundation for Middle East Peace established the bi-monthly report on Israeli settlement in the occupied territories, and we have. Uh, always relied very heavily on Shalom Mashav, uh, Peace Now in Israel, uh, for data and for analysis. Uh, their work uh, over many, many years uh, in the project called the Settlement Watch is just uh, splendid. And those of you who are not on their uh, email list and uh, don't get their regular bullet bulletins really should, because this issue. Uh, I think many, many of you would agree with me, is really at the core of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the territorial issue, uh, and stands in the way of uh, the, uh, the two-state peace, which will meet the fundamental needs of both peoples that all of us uh, yearn for. Uh, Hagit is a graduate of the Hebrew University. Uh, she is experienced in Israeli politics and public affairs. She works for uh, Yossi Balin. While he was a minister and she was active as a participant supporter of the Geneva Accord project. Uh, Hagit, we're delighted to have you. She's in the midst of an American tour of college campuses, and uh, I can think of no better investment uh, to talk to undergraduates uh, who are uh, our hope for the future. So, Hagit, welcome and thank you very much. Thank you very much to you both for posting this and, uh, and thank you for coming. Um, as I said, my name is Chagit and I'm the, officially I say that I'm uh, the settlement watch team of Peace Now. And I'm saying I'm the, the team because it's actually the team, but it sounds very uh, neat to be the, the team. So I'm the team. <laughs> and I, I drive uh, a jeep uh, around the, the West Bank, on the hills, uh, travel around to, to see settlements, to see what's, what's going on on the ground. I take a camera, I, I collect the data. Of course, it's not only about going out and just seeing what's going on, but also to try to figure out what's, what it's about and, and what the trends are and some specific problems on the ground. Etc. So this is more or less uh, my my job. And today, I will try to to talk a little about the idea of the settlement activity and the, the peace process and how actually it is devastating for the chances for peace. I mean the the settlement activity, and actually why do we need in peace now, which is an organization, a movement in Israel that's trying to advocate for peace, why do we need a settlement watch team? And why, maybe why, we are the only one to do it 
uh, except for, of course, uh, Foundation for Middle East Peace. But, uh, but I mean in Israel to do the, the, the ground uh, work. So um, since I guess that most of you are familiar with the maps and, and what, what was going on, just uh, in short, the, the background is that uh, Israel in 19, until 1967 was a small, smaller country than today. And then came the Six Day War, and Israel had occupied the, the West Bank and Gaza and the Golden Heights and the Sinai, but we are going to concentrate on the West Bank, which is on the map, and the green line was the, the border between Israel and the Jordanian uh, and the West Bank, and this is why it's called the, the green line, I mean, because it was painted in green since then. And one thing I think that if you understand will help you understand what's what's the public opinion is like in Israel. Not all Israelis realize that the West Bank is not part of Israel. It was never annexed to Israel. And Israelis, they might know it, but if you ask them, they will not know it. I mean, the, the notion of, of this being not part of Israel is not well known. And I'm sorry I forgot to change it to Hebrew, but you know, uh, the, to English, but you know, this is the West Bank, this is the Palestinian communities, and at 67 there were 600,000 of them in the West Bank and another half a million in, in Gaza, and Israel never annexed it because Israel didn't want to include all those many people under Israel, or let's say to give them the full civil rights, because the idea of having uh, Israel was to have a state for the Jewish people, and not for uh, a majority of Palestinians, and this is why Israel never annexed it. However, Israel also never withdrew or decided what to do with it. So without deciding what to do with it, Israel built and built and built settlements, and you see in 93, in which 93 is the beginning of the Oslo process, we had 140 Israeli settlements, and remember the number, 116,000 settlers. This is in 93. And then came the Oslo process, and you all remember these exciting pictures. I remember myself, I was then serving in, at the Israeli army. We were in the middle of a course, and they stopped the course and called us all out to this club where you can watch the small television that you need to hit every uh, two minutes. <laughs> and just to see the historical moment of making peace, Prime Minister Rabin shaking hands with uh, Yasser Arafat at the, the White House with President Clinton as a host. It was exciting. We really believed that this is going to be the peace that we are waiting for and actually we're going to end the conflict and everybody's happy. But then came years of hard time. And I don't know if you're familiar with this picture. It's a famous picture from the first Oslo agreement, Oslo A or the Gaza-Jericho picture uh, agreement in Cairo, May 2004. You can see Prime Minister Rabin on, on the left, standing and waiting. This, this is the signature, it's the ceremony. And then Arafat is refusing to sign. He had a problem with the maps. And all the leaders of the world, you can see Warren Christopher, Dennis Ross, Nabil Shah, uh, Putin, that was a uh, foreign minister of, of Russia, and Shimon Peres threatening, I don't know what he said to Arafat, and Mubarak, all putting pressure, please sign the, the deal. And Warren Christopher and Dennis Ross, not really sure what's going on as <laughs> part of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But it's a symbolic picture of, of actually um, the peace process did not in, um, go on with the smile, smiles and everybody's optimistic and, and everybody's happy. Because on both sides, it was difficult. For Israelis, it was very difficult to suddenly recognize 
those people and Yasser Arafat, which we always advocated the world that these are terrorists that don't want Israel. The PLO was, you are not allowed to talk to PLO in Israel according to the law. Uh, so it was hard. And the Palestinians also, to recognize Israel and to, to have some kind of hope to believe that it's going to lead to independent state, etc. So both sides were reluctant. However, um, the Oslo Agreement divided the, the West Bank into three types of land, mainly lands which is under Palestinian control, areas A and B, and all the rest under Israeli control. And you can see the, the rest is the, the brighter blue or white. It's 60% of the West Bank under Israeli control according to the, to the Oslo Agreement. And very easily you can see why. Because this is where the settlers and the settlements are and the surrounding areas also. So all the settlements are still under full Israeli control. No settlement was removed according to the Oslo Agreement. This is something very important. Israelis did not realize the importance of, of such a move. But Rabin at the time thought, I'm going to go for peace anyway. I've decided to, to freeze the settlements anyway. Why should I include it also in the agreement? I have so much opposition against the Oslo Agreement. And you know that how, how he end his life, actually because of this agreement, because he had very strong opposition and he was assassinated. So he was afraid of, of opposition. He thought, let's do it step by step. An interim agreement, and the, the pictures that you saw from 94 was an interim agreement saying that <laughs> in five years, the two sides will sign a final status agreement will, which will include everything. All the, the subjects on on the agenda, including in Jerusalem and end of conflict, this should have taken five years. But these five years did not work so well. Rabin was assassinated. Israel built in settlements. And also the Palestinians continued with the terror attacks, as we will see. This is a graph of housing units that were built in the West Bank. Um, that initiated by the, the Ministry of Housing, you have another, this is two thirds of, of what was constructed, more or less. However, if you divide it according to the, to the um, political uh, governments in Israel, you will see before Oslo, we had the Shamir government with a lot of construction. And then came Rabin with the settlement freeze, which was not full, full, but there was a decision to freeze the settlement. And this included also stopping existing projects. And it's important to mention that because this is not the case today. Um, contractors had to stop working. And the government of Israel gave them compensation. And the, and the buildings stood incomplete for several years at this <coughs> freeze. And you can see how, how the, the drop was. But then came Netanyahu and started to build more. And after Netanyahu, we were very happy in 99 that Barak was elected because we were again optimistic and there was hope for peace. But Barak, he promised, he, he really meant, I believe he meant at the time to go for a peace deal. But he, all, he said the same thing same thing that Rabin said, or the same uh, direction that Rabin said. I'm going to go for the end game. If I'm now going to freeze settlement activity, I'm going to have a position. They're going to make me my hard, my life very hard. Let me, OK, we will build. And he built. You can see double as much as Netanyahu built did Barak build. And, and, uh, and he did it because he thought that he should keep his coalition until he goes to the end game. And then in the end game, we will be uh, like the, the real elections or the real question of, is, are we going to peace or not? And he knew rightly that if he succeeded, 
if in, in peace, he will be supported fully. And then came the Second Intifada and the unity government of Sharon that continued to build, and also uh, Olmert's government continues to build more or less in the same uh, amount, a couple of thousand of housing units every year in the West Bank. And I believe that to reduce in the number that you see here is pretty much um, connected to the violence that was going on in the West Bank, uh, that people less wanted to go to the West Bank because it was dangerous. So you saw, you saw some slowdown. And this slowdown is still going on until today. And maybe if you hear some settlers uh, crying that the settlements has been freezed, etc., it's, it's the same trend from for seven years already. It's not nothing new. So what did we do in the, in the post-Oslo uh, process? If you, you, have, you have many ways to look at it, but a uh, number of settlers, all these in, in yellow are post-Oslo. Or for, if you look on another uh, way of looking at it, most of the settlers are, came, came to the settlements after Oslo. Or if you take the biggest settlement today, Modi'in Elit, it's an ultra-Orthodox city, it was um, founded after Oslo. So the message for the Palestinians was actually, if you talk to the Israelis, they build and double the number of settlers. And this was one of the biggest uh, bases of, of the frustration of the, the Palestinians as soon as the Camp David talks did not conclude uh, with an agreement. They said, we went all this way, we talked to the Israelis, and we got this new town with 30,000 people. Uh, so lack of faith was on, at least on one side. But I just want to mention that also on the Israeli side, and this is something that as much as we advocate and we persuade all the people that we should go and make peace as soon as you have in Israel a terror attack or any attack on, on citizens, it could ruin a year's work of advocacy because people are seeing, you see, we went for Oslo. For Israelis, Oslo was peace. We were going to peace. We were evacuating our troops from, from cities. And look, we have more killed. I don't know if you see the numbers down here. Before Oslo, in the first intifada, you had 160 Israeli killed. And then after Oslo, 260. That was um, devastating for the support for peace. And also, we see it today. But we have to mention that there is also uh, the killings uh, continued also on the other side, and also Palestinians were killed during that time. So then came the Camp David. Also optimistic uh, pictures. Uh, people are smiling. Although here, you, I don't know if you remember that, when they entered the room, uh, each, each one of the leaders wanted to, to let the other get in before. And then we end up with Barak pushing uh, Arafat inside. And this is really symbolic. Because if you ask people how it really was, this was the case. Barak pushed Arafat into this uh, uh, Camp David, and Clinton had to accept it and to smile and to host it. And it didn't work out. And I, I don't want to talk too much on why it didn't work out, because this is something for another lecture. However, what we have today is 120 set settlements. Uh, 275 settlers, and I didn't include East Jerusalem. In East Jerusalem, there is another, there are another 179,000, more or less. And the Palestinians are two and a half millions, more or less, in the West Bank. And adding to that, the illegal outposts, which are the red dots over here. Israel decided in '96, the government of so blue is the established settlements, red is the so-called unauthorized outposts. Exactly. Okay. 
um, Israel decided in 96 not to build new settlements. And when Olmert today is saying, well, I decided not to build new settlements, it's not news. It's something that Israel decided already in 96. So it's not something that we should have gone to Annapolis for. However, since then, Israel established 100 new settlements. But Israel did it unofficially, even illegally, according to Israel. But it was supported by the Israeli government, these 100 illegal outposts that are now part of the subjects to be dealt with on the interim uh, stage of, of negotiations. Anyway, another thing that grew up since uh, can, can, 2000. You go back one step and explain what you mean by although these were not authorized by the Israeli government, in what ways do those outposts receive official assistance and support? Yeah, this is, many, is, many people do not understand what I'm saying. I'm saying the government of Israel decided not to build and then built illegally. Um, the fact is that the government supported those outposts, funded them, in many cases, even built the infrastructure for the for the outposts. Uh, the municipalities gave the structures, gave the the electricity, the water. Everything was under the open eye of the authority of the Israeli government, and this was part of the policy of the government, either to encourage it like in Netanyahu time when, when his minister, uh, foreign minister Sharon, coming back from white plantation talks and then calling for the settlers to go out to the hills, or by turning blind high, not looking on, on what the, the settlers are doing or not looking on what the Ministry of Housing is doing by funding those settlements. And th this is something that went on since the middle of the 19s until actually about 2005. 2005. Since 2005, Israel is not building new outposts. And the story of outposts is not that the settler decided to build it and, and now the government doesn't know what to do, because the settlers are now trying to do it again. They, they make those demonstrations of putting up a settlement, and then the army kicks them away. I mean, it's not... It's, it's about the government to decide. It's not that the settler sets the, the, the facts on the ground and, and nobody is capable of doing anything. So adding to that, all the checkpoints and roadblocks, these numbers are really, you know, it changes every other day. And uh, I just want to uh, stress that those checkpoints are meant to mainly to protect the settlements and the settlers while they, they move and drive the, the road. And I say it because only 35 of the checkpoints are last before Israel. I mean, if Israel wants to protect and it's, it's uh, legitimate and reasonable to, to check those people who enter Israel, these are the 35 checkpoints to, to, to check them. However, all the rest, are just inside the West Bank. For instance, if a Palestinian want to go from Nablus to Ramallah, he has to go through checkpoints. And this is only meant to protect the settlers and the settlements. And all what the Israeli IDF is doing today in the West Bank is meant to protect the settlements because we never decided to remove the settlements. And adding to this, the separation barrier, fence, wall, security fence, whatever you want to call it. It's a huge enterprise and its route, it's in black in the, in the map, is not along the green line to protect only Israel from potential terrorism entering Israel, but it is within the West Bank to protect and also maybe to annex settlements into Israel. And it's a big enterprise. It's not only a fence. It's, it's a road. Here you see this road from uh, 
aerial photo and here it how it looks like like they they had to cut this this mountain and to pave this road uh, the fences you have a fence you have a dirt road for the footprints and then you have the road for the patrol of, of the the army and then another small fence to protect the jeep that is so it's it's a huge enterprise and you have also roads that Israel is now paving for the Palestinians because we did the fence inside the Palestinian territory so we need to make them roads that they can bypass the the fence so for instance this is a bypass road for Palestinians in uh, ne next to Givat Zev actually to make them cross under the settlement block uh, so they cannot run away tremendous enterprise now in Gaza Strip we used to have a couple of uh, or uh, settlements and about 8,000 settlers and Israel uh, evacuated them in 2005 and actually this is one of the hardest points for for peace now today advocating for peace in Israel because people are saying okay I agree we will I'm, I'm ready to give up on settlement but look what happened in Gaza we gave up on settlements we went out and then we got rockets and if we go out of the West Bank we will get rockets so we don't want to do it we don't believe the, the Palestinians and that's that and, and it's a very serious problem to persuade the people so I have I have a good answer and a bad answer the, the the bad answer which is good but it's not working on Israelis is to say listen Gaza is still under occupation you know they cannot go out we control everything in Gaza although we are not on the street but it's still under occupation this is not working on, on Israelis I mean they say come on if they didn't shoot we wouldn't need to control their their entries etc so it's it's not working what I do try to say is the fact that we withdrew from Gaza unilaterally and actually this it's like the the other side of the coin of building in settlements during the peace process Sharon the Prime Minister I don't know why but he didn't ask didn't talk to me before he did the disengagement and I really regret it because, <laughs> because if he did I would tell him you know take Abbas you don't believe him you don't want to talk to him but take him to a closed room and and tell him I don't believe you I don't want to talk to you but I decided in Israel interest is to leave Gaza so now we go out of the room and Abbas is going to declare you see I negotiated with the Israelis and I liberated Gaza and now I'm going to be the I, I will have the control and the Palestinians will say wow uh, Abbas was right we should negotiate we, we should talk we shouldn't shoot instead Israel decided not to talk to him not even to pretend to talk to him and gave Gaza to Hamas and Hamas knew how to use it they said 10 years of negotiations with Israel built or doubled the number of settlers five years of shooting liberated Gaza this is something horrible that Israel is actually uh, conveying to the Palestinian public so the, the fact that we continue to build in settlements that's the message that we give to the Palestinians and this is why in peace now we're trying to 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 advocate or to to educate the Israeli public so just to conclude we got to another smiling optimistic pictures of leaders shaking hands in Annapolis uh, last November and there should be now another summit on May the three the same three people in Sharm el-Sheikh and I'm sure they will be smiling and shaking hands the question is what will be the the content of those talkings Israel took or um, Olmert declared to be, to commit committed himself to three things that Israel is committed to from the 
road uh, roadmap already five years ago. Anyway, we're committed again. Settlement freeze, evacuation of outposts, and removal of checkpoints and roadblocks. So let's see what's going on in settlements. Construction is still going on. What started before continued to be built. What uh, some new buildings were, were started and even new, new plans were uh, approved. And, um, and this is in settlements. In outposts, this is a picture from an outpost, Givata uh, Tamar, um, and it's all post Annapolis. Um, construction is still going on in outposts. Uh, no outpost was evacuated, and I know that the, the Israeli government declared that two, actually the prime minister declared that two outposts were removed, so we know which he was referring to. One was not a, an outpost, it was just a broken caravan next to a Fra settlement that was removed. The other was just not removed. I was there and I took pictures of it. Nobody removed it. And um, construction go, uh, continues. And in East Jerusalem, we, we see uh, an increase of new tenders and promotion of, of plans in East Jerusalem that are being built. All the data is available on our latest report that was published. HU is housing units? Yes, HU housing units. Um, or Hebrew University. Uh, <laughs> Roblox. Um, this is a game that is the, the IDF is playing all the time. For instance, this is a roadblock near Silwad that is in the list of those that were removed. Now look, you can see there was, I don't know if you all see it, there was an earth mount. Here you can see that the, the road is broken. There was an earth mount, and it was removed, and it's very nice of the IDF to have removed it. <laughs> <laughs> they removed it and put a new gate. I, I know it's funny, but it's really horrible. And they declare that they removed it, and it's not the only place they did so. Now they put a lot of new rails mounts to, just to, to take them away. And they bought and brought uh, all the televisions to, to film them taking out the Rimonim checkpoint. The Rimonim checkpoint is not active for over one year already. I go there, I know, I, I passed there. Uh, James saw it. And when we passed one way, it was like a, a few s soldiers there just uh, because they do what they call the flying checkpoints from time to time, here and there. But when we were back, nobody was there. So it's just a game they play. They don't want to really change things on the ground, unfortunately. So situation today, lots of settlements, lots of settlers. Uh, if we see what Israel is going to, the separation fence, it's huge settlement blocks. And, and the settlement blocks is something that nobody ever defined. But if you take the, the root of the fence, it looks like that it doesn't really uh, give any chance for a, a Palestinian state, although the very idea of settlement blocks has, of course, Israeli support, but we got lately the support of President Bush that said settlement blocks are part of the facts on the ground that we have to take care of. So there is a possibility for settlement blocks under uh, an idea of, of uh, land swap in an agreement, and this we had in the, in the Geneva Initiative, which is the only model that we, we know already that it could be agreed upon. But you can see the difference in, in the size of the blocks and how much land they take and, and the surrounding of it. Although it, it does uh, annex the vast majority of the settlers. So, I think this is still possible to achieve. And even this year, I know it's hard to believe. It's, it's, we don't know what will be in May. But if, if what we know is, is true, then it will probably be another photo op with the, the President of the United States
talking about number of roadblocks to be removed instead of numbers of dividing Jerusalem or the questions of refugees and the borders of Israel. So I just hope that they have a secret channel where they promote the peace deal and we will see a peace deal, inshallah, I, I wish, but, uh, but I believe it's, uh, it's possible. We're going to open this up to, to, to a Q&A, and, and Chagid is very um, ready and willing to, uh, to take your most piercing and, uh, and challenging of questions. Uh, I just add, before we do that, that um, it's great for me personally to have Chagid here. We were colleagues for a period of time at the Justice Ministry under Ehud Barak, and we were in a conversation with someone when Chagid was talking about some of this stuff. He said, so why couldn't you stop it? And, uh, well, we failed as well. Um, and, and, and now that Chagid is driving her Jeep uh, around the West Bank, which I think is different from driving a Jeep around Rockville uh, or, or Bethesda <laughs> and counting, uh, count, counting this phenomenon of the outposts and the settlement and the, the housing units. What, one thing that struck me in your presentation, Chagid, is because you're right. I think the question that so many of us face is, but we left Gaza, uh, and look what happened. And I think you're right when the comeback is, um, well, under international law, actually, it's still recognized as an occupation, uh, which is the case. It, 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 doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't come much, come much ice. I, I mean, I do think that, that that response on the nature of how we did it, creating no predictability of outcome, on the other side because it was unilateral is very important um, because I think it also makes the following statement. People like Hagit, Peace Now, which could not be more on the other side of the debate to the settlements and the settlers, was not in this because we are waiting for the moment where we can pop the champagne bottles over the destruction of the settlements. Destroying settlements was not an end in itself, not for peace now, not for the rest of the peace movement. The position was always trying to have a responsible position, which is that in order to create a stable two-state solution, in order to improve security, you're going to have to withdraw those settlements and withdraw them in that context. So I think there was very little um, glee uh, or celebration in terms of how it was done. The other thing I would just add, and, and, and I think the rocket attacks on, on uh, on civilians coming out of Gaza are, are unforgivable and excusable under any circumstances. What, what I think is, is relevant in this context is, the, uh, is, of course, the continued occupation in the West Bank. You know, I think in, 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 and I've spoken to people who've said, well, when I speak to American audiences and I say to them, well, if you ended, you know, let's say part of America was under an occupation, and you ended the occupation in an area the size of one-tenth of Rhode Island, which is the smallest of the 50 states, I'm told, um, but continued it in an area more than double the size of Rhode Island, would the residents in that one-tenth of Rhode Island that was deoccupied kind of say, oh, good, well, we're all right, Jack, now. Everything's fine. Chagit, you referred, and I just want to pass on a piece of information here, to that network of, uh, of roadblocks and, uh, and checkpoints, etc. The, the most authoritative source on this is something called OCHA, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs of the United Nations. That's what the World Bank uses. In many ways, that's what the State Department used. It's even where the IDF goes for validation. If it says we've done something, they'll give the coordinates to OCHA to verify them. OCHA's pre-Annapolis count was, I think, 546 uh, obstacles to Palestinian freedom of movement. And obstacles can be anything from a checkpoint to an earth mound to the yellow gate that you saw in Chagit's picture. The most recent count was 580. The West Bank is more or less the size of, uh, um, it's a little smaller, I think, the, of, of Delaware, which is the second smallest state. So 500 obstacles to freedom of movement in, in an area of that size. 
Ocha just shared with me where things stand now. And, and as people remember, during the last visit of Secretary Rice, an agreement was reached. And part of that agreement was the removal of 50 of these obstacles to, to Palestinian freedom of movement. Now, the IDF claimed that it had removed 61 and provided the coordinates, the GPS coordinates of those 61 to Ocha in order for them to, to be a verifying source. Ocha found the following. 44 of the 61 had been removed. However, of the 61, only five of those were part of Ocha's 580 count. In other words, the other 56 were deemed not real obstacles or of minimal or no significance when it came to Palestinian freedom of movement that they didn't even count them amongst the 580. Somewhere in a field, somewhere that, that Palestinians don't move. Of the remaining 17, 44 of the 61, uh, as I said, were removed even though only five of the 61 were counted in the 580 count. And of the remaining 17, six were still there and 11 they had never identified in the past as having existed. Um, so that was uh, the, the, the Ocha response on that. I just want to refer to one other thing you said and, and use that as, as my segue into a question which I'll abuse the fact that I'm standing here to ask and then we'll open it up. You, you, you explained, and we were all part of it, so it, it, it rang very um, familiar to me, that the argument when you've had governments in Israel who have claimed, and I believe with sincerity, their desire to genuinely close a deal and pursue a two-state solution has been the argument to the progressive camp in Israel and the argument to the international community, including the American government, has been, listen, we're negotiating the big issues. We need to hold and keep our coalition together and keep maximum domestic support until that moment of truth. Don't pester us with settlements and checkpoints right now while we're negotiating the permanent borders. Because it's kind of an either or. If you want us to go to the mats and have our domestic war over a settlement freeze, we don't think we can sustain both that and negotiations which will define permanent borders. And if we have permanent borders, of course, there's no more settlements. What's, what's agreed Israel is Israel and what's beyond it is Palestine and, and there's no, no settlements there. The problem has been historically and it continues today, and it's exactly the argument used by the Olmert government. The one exception, by the way, was the Sharon government, which didn't say it was negotiating a two-state solution. It actually said, we're going to continue to settle the West Bank in order to avoid there ever being a two-state solution. But the argument is used today. It was used under the Barak government, used to a certain extent during the Rabin government. And of course, the problem has been that the first side of the equation has been maintained. We can't freeze the settlements. We We'll do what we can, but we're going to have to keep on expanding. The second side of the equation never happened. We didn't actually close the two-state deal. There was no border established. So the end product at the end of any of those governments is more settlements, no peace deal. Why is it so difficult, Khagid? Why, if you've got an Israeli government ostensibly committed to, to not doing that, if you've got an American administration ostensibly committed to a roadmap, Where's, where's the huge disconnect? And I'm going to ask you to stand here and I'll stand behind you so that we can still record. That's a very hard question that you're asking. Um, I think two, two main things. One is the, the coalition or the political either system in Israel, but in the government of Olmert, he includes also religious parties, especially now the Shas party, uh, which is doing its best to, to advocate or to make sure that the construction will go on. And all prime ministers in, in this political structure of, of uh, the Israeli political system has to rely on those religious groups and when those religious groups putting all their efforts on one subject, they can really threat the, the prime minister. And I'm sure that Olmert is afraid that Shas would decide to leave him. 
I just think that uh, the threat is not so big because Shas will not be so quickly uh, leaving the government because they have a, a lot to lose. I mean, they, they like to be ministers, they have a lot of budgets, but they might. And also, if they leave, he, he can have coalition. He can have the labor, he can have the Meretz party, which is very small, but supports the, the peace anyway. And also, the Arab parties that will support the, the peace uh, process. But this is something that most politicians in Israel do not want because they do, want, don't, do not want to be perceived as leftist, what we call leftist, or peaceniks. Uh, they want to have as much as support as they can from the center. This is one big uh, obstacle. And the other is maybe what I started with. The Israeli public do not really understand all what I just told you. Beginning with the very fact that, that, the, that the West Bank was never even annexed to Israel. So now, for instance, I think that the settlers, I realized that they lost the battle on the small settlements in the Israeli public. Because when Olmert was elected, he promised further re uh, disengagement in the West Bank. And this was the majority said, yes, we want to get rid of those settlements in the West Bank. So the settlers now are advocating more and more for the settlement blocks. These are strategic for Israel. The blocks are anyway are going to be part of Israel, even in agreement. So let's build and build there. And this is very hard to say, stop it. Don't build it. Exactly because, well, Olmert is saying the right things all the time. How can you be opposition to a person who's saying the right things, to, that's saying what I'm saying? but doing the opposite. So that's another problem. And I think that the third, maybe the third thing would be the fact that there is a unity government in the last seven years in Israel. That means that there is no real peace opposition. That means what used to be the leadership of the peace camp in Israel, the Labour Party, <coughs> joined Sharon and then joined Olmert and acting as the same policy of, of Olmert, and it's very hard to, to, to rise, to raise the, the, the opposition that calls for peace, because the leadership of peace is in the government, and they would not criticize the, the prime minister. So in my view, the fact that Labour joined uh, Likud at the time, and now Kadima, was one of the biggest devastating uh, things to the peace process. I, 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 I'll add to, to, to that, Hagi, that is, as, as you mentioned in the talk, some of the biggest settlements now, albeit close to the Green Line, and some of the newest settlements are designed to cater exclusively to the ultra-Orthodox communities, which is a new thing. And as you know, in Israel you have the, the modern Orthodox is more associated with the settler movement a party called the National Religious Party, etc. The ultra-Orthodox parties, Shas, for those who are familiar with the names, United Torah Judaism, historically were not part of the settler movement. What happened is, due to pressures on their communities in Jerusalem, essentially, the settler movement, I think, made a big push to establish settlements exclusively for the ultra-Orthodox Shas and United Torah Judaism constituencies in the vicinity of Jerusalem. And that made them, those political parties, a strong constituency for settlement expansion. And if you see Shas today, that's, I mean, I think it was a strategically brilliant move by the settler movement. And as usual, the other side was completely wrong-footed and unstrategic in its response. Um, and today, that's what they're, they're fighting for their own communities expansion beyond the green line, but uh, uh, I'd like to, to, to open it up here. And, uh, yeah, just a very quick question based on... Those. People can introduce themselves, sorry. Um, I, I'm Kay Halpern. Um, very quick question. When you talk about the ultra-Orthodox, would that include, for example, uh, the people uh, 
who have been living, for example, in Mea Shireen in Jerusalem, because they have traditionally been very opposed even to the state of Israel. Sure, but they're very they're very in favor of having cheap housing for their rapidly expanding population. And if that cheap housing happens to be just over the green line in Modin Elite. Yeah, there is a, I can try to use this. That's amazing. This Modin Elite is what I told you, almost 40,000 people. But here, uh, Beitar Elite, uh, with 30 something thousand. And now the, the new project that was uh, very famous in the last few months in Givat Ze'ev, which is not a religious settlement, it's actually a new settlement annexed to Givat Ze'ev for uh, ultra-Orthodox. And that's both Ashkenazi and Sephardi. Yes, they're both Ashkenazi and Sephardi. And people are telling me that Shas got from the contractors the promise to have three, <coughs> three synagogues for the Sephardim and then two mikvahs and whatever so that they, they can bring their people in. Cool, sounds good to me. Uh, yeah. go right to the back and then we'll come to the front. Um, Yuda Lukacs from George Mason University. Um, certainly the work of Peace Now is admirable in terms of um, documenting the growth and expansion of the settlement movement, but I believe that there's one dimension that falls short, which is the what I call follow the money. Uh, I think I have yet to see a credible study uh, that documents the budget, the governmental budget, the private money from Israel, private money from outside of Israel that has been invested um, in this mammoth project for, since 1967. And I think a financial argument <coughs> has to go hand in hand with presenting the demographic and the environmental and the other implications of the growth of the settlement. But that argument, in my opinion, is totally lacking. At least I have yet to see a credible study that documents in a very deep manner what has really happened from a financial point of view. Granted, you can take a four by four and with a camera. It's a very different uh, situation. But So that's one, one issue. The second one, are you aware of any credible study that focuses on examining the financial aspects of the settlement issue? Uh, first of all, I agree with you. The, this study should be done, and there were some uh, starts and some studies to variable, uh, variable uh, extents. There is a study made by Peace Now in 2002. Uh, there is a study made by the Adva Institute, which is uh, doing research on, on economics in Israel in '93. There is something made by uh, Macro Institute that uh, tried to assess the, the, how much the, the settlement worth. But comprehensive, and there was the Haaretz project uh, in '93 that um, also did very comprehensive work on, on the, the cost of settlements. Everybody knows that it's a lot of money, but it's very hard to, to, to calculate it. So there are a few, but not something that I would jump up with. A anyone who, I, 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 I strongly take your point. Um, <coughs> what interests me in particular right now is the money trail from here to there. Anyone who uh, anyone who wants to pursue that, see us afterwards. Uh, no, really, the, the the Christians United for Israel, which is the organisation led by Pastor John Hagee, uh, much beloved amongst Catholics. As uh, well as yeah. um, he, uh, they had their big conference in Jerusalem last week, and they announced apparently the disbursement of six million dollars of, of assistance in Israel. Now again, that, that it's. They, they, they don't reveal anything on their website, I can tell you that much. It's very difficult to glean the information just from a cursory glance. But one of the public announcements then was that part of the money would go to establishing a new conference center in Ariel, <coughs> in the settlement of Ariel. And we know that a significant amount of that money goes there uh, to settlements. We know that some of the mega churches have adopter settlement projects. Um, we know that it just so happens that on the nights to honor Israel that Kufi holds, quite often it's mayors from settlements, especially the mayor of Ariel, Rob Nachman, uh, who is appearing. 
Uh, there's some work on this. Stephen Sizer has a book on Christian Zionism, Roadmap to Armageddon, and he has some useful facts and figures on the, on the money, but I don't think there's ever been that big expose piece. Uh, please, here. My question's, I'm Warren Clark from Church of Middle East Peace. My question is also about money, but it's the other side of it. That is, if you conjecture something like uh, a two-state solution as, as outlined by the Geneva Initiative, just as a hypothetical, uh, would there not be tremendous costs attached to that? That is, are you talking about uh, subsidizing settlers moving back into Israel? Uh, you can't assume, I suppose politically, that uh, settlers would agree to stay under areas of Palestinian sovereignty. So presumably, politically, they would have to be assisted to, to move someplace else or some accommodation. Would there not be major costs attached to a execution carrying out a two-state solution? It's going to cost a lot, yes. But I think that uh, every day in, in occupation costs a lot also and in the long run costs much, much more to Israel. So it's going to cost a lot, yeah. But I do not believe that there will be uh, many settlers that would agree to be under Palestinian authorities. This is, they would not want to do that. Has anybody figured out how much a two-state solution would cost? Don't forget the compensation for uh, Palestinian refugees. I believe you've talked about that. Yes. Uh, Listen, uh, some people say that uh, money is the, the cheapest uh, uh, resource or whatever. Uh, we, will, we will have to, to find the, the, the money. If we find the money to, to build all this and to protect all this, Le less than a month, less than, with, with think, think of this. have a role in that? <laughs> well, 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 think, I mean, if those who do consider that America p pays a price for the unresolved Palestinian conflict in terms of alliances it can build, in terms of it can't build under these circumstances, in terms of anger generated with America, uh, in terms of a sense of grievance. Take that on one side of the ledger. One month of the cost of the war in Iraq? You'd have a lot of change left over from resettling the settlers and compensating the refugees. You're preaching a bit to the converted here. My point is, don't you think that a lot has to be, you know, a lot of work has to be done here in the United States for public opinion? And with the U.S. Congress. I'm assuming it's a rhetorical question, so yeah. I'll just say yes. <laughs> we have a wonderful uh, group, uh, you know, APN and all those that are doing a lot of work here. I can take Hi, I'm Chris Zambalos from Filios Global. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the position of the sizable Arab community inside Israel and what their feelings are about the settlements. Uh, obviously, it's no secret they live as second class citizens as Israeli citizens. Um, there are also increasing reports that uh, the Arab community is uh, starting to express itself more in solidarity with their team in the occupied territories. How does that figure into the security calculus of Israel and what's involved in um, it remaining in the West Bank, but also just in general? Daniel, I think you, you're better than me on this subject, right? Look, as, as, as far as the, uh, and I think there are two ways of looking at it from the, how does, how does the, the Palestinian Arab community inside Israel view this position? And from, from two, through two prisms. One is, is as, as Palestinians, which is that this is part of an occupation that they are opposed to, uh, and it's part of the, I think they would mostly consider this as it's part of the dispossession process that they themselves have been through um, in many ways, which is one prism. I think there's a second prism through which they look at that, which is the citizens of the state of Israel, which is this is another chunk of tax money, of government budget going to exclusively Jewish purposes. So I think they would also look at this uh, as part of the skewed priorities of a, of a system that structurally discriminates against them. Um, I, I mean, yeah, there are a lot of questions as to what should be the long-term dispensation, the long-term relationship between a state which defines itself as Jewish and democratic and a non-Jewish minority. I think many people have, draw, have drawn the conclusion that a radical revision 
of that relationship uh, an ability to prove that you can remove the structural inequalities would go a long way to resolving those issues before you'd have to change the definition of the state. And this would just be another, uh, albeit very um, in your face, very poking in the eye example of the skewed priorities and, 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 and that kind of a discrimination. I'll take Paul, we'll probably collect in twos, I'll take Paul and, and the gentleman. Uh, Paul Tram, the Middle East Institute. Traditionally, there's been a differentiation uh, in looking at the settlers between the so-called lifestyle settlers and the ideological settlers. And uh, the assumption is the, uh, the lifestyle settlers, if they get decent compensation, will have less problem moving back to Israel. Um, I was wondering how in current uh, settlement. I mean, somebody is moving into the uh, settlements, that are, the uh, houses that are being built now. Obviously, at the outposts are the so-called hilltop youth, the people who are uh, ultra ideological. But as far are there, who are the people who are moving in now? Uh, this is one question. Are they? My assumption is they are. Uh, they are mostly Orthodox, or, or a good chunk of them American or limb, new American immigrants who came to Israel specifically for that. But also, how? What sort of work are you doing among the lifestyle settlers, and how can you persuade them, given how the government has? bungled so completely the, uh, the um, uh, compensation for the Gaza uh, returnees, uh, how can you develop some sort of feeling among them that they are willing to return uh, given what they've seen? Okay, let me try to do it like very broadly. We can divide the, the settlements or the settler population to three. Those who are ideologically motivated, who are religious, they settle more, most of you, most of, in the, in the middle of, of the West Bank. Um, other, the other third is those ultra-Orthodox that, uh, that Daniel talked about over here, and here, and a little around Jerusalem. And the third one would be normal, normal Israelis, who just want cheaper housing, and I always give the, the example of my two rooms uh, apartment that I rent in the center of Jerusalem. I could have, in the same <coughs> way, rented five rooms with a garden in Maale Adumim, which is in West Bank and 10 minutes drive from Jerusalem. So many young couples would, would go there, and also, some small communities that came into this, the settlements in the 70s or even the beginning of the 80s, mainly on the Jordan Valley. Some stuck over here, that doesn't know what, what to do with themselves, and some here. And these are ready, not only ready, really eager to, to leave the settlements. Many of them, I cannot say all of them, and uh, they just want uh, the compensation. Some of them are trying to make as much as money as possible. They say, well, 100,000, I don't go. But if you give me half a million, <laughs> but I have to go for me. So uh, there is, I, I believe, and also very important, in a, the problem is that many of the, the people who are ready to, to leave the settlement live on the, in the settlement blocks that are we don't know what it would be, but less likely, or which will be much harder today to offer them compensation to move. And, uh, and those hard, hard uh, core settlers, in case of, an, of a peace agreement, I believe the majority, the vast majority, including of those religious settlers that to the stereotype with the uh, and the scarf and, and the, the baby. These are going, most of them will say, will cry and go home quietly. 
because this would be the end game, this would be the decision of the people of Israel, and they are responsible people, like they were in, in Gaza. There will be the youngsters that will make what in Israel we call Balagan, will make a mess, and okay, there will be the demonstrations. Arshad and, and, and this guy. Sorry, I'll take Arshad do yourself. With respect to the uh, rockets coming out of uh, Gaza, uh, there's not many rockets coming out of the West Bank. You, you've got all those checkpoints and so forth. Uh, could that problem have been solved uh, by le leaving some of the military in Gaza, setting up checkpoints? I would suspect so, and I'm, I'd be almost cynical that, that they were withdrawn on purpose. Uh, another question is: Do you have a do you have a an intermediate? Is there an, an intermediate concept for withdrawing settlements from the West Bank, where a lot of the checkpoints, presumably not all of them, would remain, in order to maintain security, until you had a peace agreement? And I'm going to take two questions. So. Just, you had an excellent slide on <coughs> I'm Marshad Mohammed, I cover the State Department for Reuters. I'd like very much the slide that you had that listed the housing tenders or the settlement expansion post Annapolis, you know, starting with the 370, <coughs> or Arcoma, and so on. Can you explain to us, um, if you know, how many of these uh, reflect entirely new construction plans, and how much reflects the continuation of previous relay plans? And can you also explain to us? Um, just where these settlement areas are in terms of what the political logic of doing these was. And then uh, the other question is, it, it seems to me, you know, almost every time, not almost every time, but say the last trip that Sir Harris made to the region, we had barely left uh, Jerusalem. We had just landed in Amman, and there was another announcement of, you know, we joke about it on the plane, because it, you know, sort of like the door hitting on the way out. Uh, and uh, oh, the door slamming as she, she leaves. And my question is sort of twofold. Uh, one, it seems to me as if the administration has essentially uh, acquiesced in this. I mean, even though there are the form of criticisms of it that they just have sort of given up or they feel like this is just part of the cost of doing business. Um, do you concur with that? And how much of a political, a domestic Israeli political cost there, would there be to the Omer government to an absolute freeze, to say, no, we're not going to do these things during this period when we are ostensibly <coughs> engaged in serious negotiations. Um, okay. Uh, as for your question, it's, it's very questionable uh, if the checkpoints are conducive for the security of Israel in terms of rockets. <coughs> and there are many military seniors that argue the opposite, that the, the fact that the Palestinian economy cannot grow, the fact that every small movement in the West Bank is so hard only enlarges the motivation of, of uh, Palestinians to take part in the armed struggle. And as for the rockets, this is so easy to, to have this rocket. It's like a it's like a, 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 you, ju you just need a, a pipe, and and I'm afraid that there might be the day that they decide strategically to start to roll the 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 rockets from the West Bank, and I don't believe that the IDF will be able to stop it, even if we control all of it, because it's it's like in the hands of, of kids. It's it's not. It's not so easy to stop, in, in my view. So it's, it's questionable, the, the role of, of checkpoints. Uh, when you see tenders, tenders is all, only uh, after a plan was approved. This plan was approved in Halkoma, was approved in 2005, and it's part of ongoing construction. Uh, they finished another chunk of, of buildings, and then they publish another tender, etc. And the Surbacher neighborhood, which is between Surbacher and the Jewish neighborhood of uh, East Talpiot, I think the, the plan was approved several years ago. I don't remember by heart, but yeah, um, as for those 
new, the, the 300, the, the 3,500 um, housing units here uh, is, is the new plans that have been promoted, yet not uh, finally approved, but promoted. Um, your question, just remind me. It seems to me like the administration has oh, almost right, right. acquiesced yes, in yes, stuff yes. that they assume the that yeah, they're okay. really keep. No. Okay. Um, I think it's really embarrassing, the fact that the, the Secretary of State is coming here and dealing with, with the earth mounds or with outposts that are not so significant in what we're talking about. I, I think it would be much more conducive today if they put all their pressure on the peace talks that I pray that they're being hold, held somewhere, a secret channel or whatever, to put, this is where the, even, you know, it's easier for Olmert to go for a peace deal rather than freeze the settlements now when there is, after he, all his declaration has been eroded the way it was. Mm -hmm. He didn't specify what was a settlement freeze. So the his opposition, jumped and said, oh, it doesn't include Jerusalem. Now let's, Jerusalem is a myth or is a, something that you, in the Israeli public, you cannot, it's very hard to find against. So Olmed gave it up in the first day. He said, well, it doesn't include Jerusalem. And then they, they put the pressure on, on the, the settlement blocks without defining what it was. And he also surrendered, and I think and he didn't gain anything because who, who, the fame is, is given to those the religious parties that put the pressure. He just, I think the, the, best, the best and conducive thing to do today is to, to put the, most of the pressure on the end game. And I really don't want to see the president coming in, in May and dealing with numbers of caravans with the t two leaders in Sharm el Sheikh, and only if they talk about the, like they will have a draft of, of something, of an agreement, this could be the real debate, and I'm sure, really positive, that the Israeli public will hug any agreement that they will get, because the, the public is ready for the con concessions. The only obstacle is that the lack of faith. People do not believe that the other side would agree. But if we have an agreement on the other side, and we have the support of the United States and actually all the world, and the Arab Initiative to show it as if a historical movement, people will, will go for it. Um, and it will be much easier than persuading them, don't do that now because it's undermining Abu Mazen. No, I, I, I wanna, I'll, I'll, I'll disagree without detailing on the value of having a, a a piece of paper agreement right now with well, the current actors who are excluded continue to be excluded. But I do want to add something on the America point, because I think this is a, there's a serious credibility deficit. And I think you'll hear the argument made across the Middle East, well, if we've set the preconditions for talking to actor A, B, C, or D, and they don't meet them, and we recant on our position, where does that leave the projection of American power and American seriousness? And yet you do have a situation four years into a, five years into roadmap commitments, several months into Annapolis commitments, where those commitments are not only not being met, but the announcement is made while the tarmac is still warm. Um, I think there's a degree of American culpability which is worth pointing out. I think something the administration did has been very, very unhelpful, and it's the following. In April of 2004, there was an exchange of letters between President Bush and then Prime Minister Sharon. And for the first time in that exchange of letters, the United States unilaterally recognized that there would be changes to the 67 lines based on the population centers. The justification that Israel has used ever since then for much of what the expansion is, is the Americans can't oppose this. You've already accepted that the population centers will be part of Israel in the future. Um, it seriously undermined the, the, any American effort at settlement freeze. But to be honest, it's a reasonable argument by the Israeli side if you agree the final borders. In the absence of doing that, all it says to the Palestinian side is, 
no faith in, in the negotiations, no faith that there'll ever be a two-state solution, um, etc. And no faith, of course, and no faith in the American role. I think that this administration does see this as a cost of doing business, and I, I think they're right, by the way. I mean, I, th I think it would be, to a, certain, to a significant extent, it would be a pretty thankless task running after each of these things, with one exception. What I think a serious um, diplomatic effort and team can do is prevent this before it keep the horses inside the stable, prevent this before it bolts the stable. Once this is announced and you're in a public pissing match with an Israeli government, it's very difficult. If you have a serious team on the ground working with the different ministries, then you can explain to the housing minister, you can explain to the leader of Shas, as the American envoy, why if this announcement is made, it is very problematic for the bilateral relationship and for all kinds of other things that, are, in, in, in a way, you're helping the Israeli Prime Minister in that respect. I don't think you've seen that. I think, at the, at the minimum, prevent more harm from being done. Um, but I do want to, uh, want to ask Phil to, to come in at this stage, and then we're going to take one last round of questions. <coughs> don't forget, Daniel, that in the famous letter of April 14th, um, the exchange of letters between Bush and Sharon, that whereas the president did say that uh, the realities on the ground have changed the situation and that uh, it's unlikely that the 49 armistice line could be restored. He also said that all of this ultimately has to be decided by mutual agreement. Uh, so the U.S. government has not, uh, has not uh, completely sold the farm. Uh, and a future administration can, can give greater stress to the mutual agreement than facts on the ground. But Hagit, you, you paint a very bleak picture of a dysfunctional Israeli political system in which minority uh, religious and settler parties uh, have always prevailed, uh, notwithstanding public opinion polls that show that a majority of Israelis dislike settlements and believe they are a, 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 an obstacle to peace. Uh, Given the strength of these minority parties, if the United States did wish to adopt its own policies on settlement and uh, present them to, uh, to the, the government of Israel and to the Israeli public, would these small uh, splitter parties who are a minority in Israel still be able to block a peace agreement? And would this uh, uh, unstoppable uh, machine of building settlements, building outposts, which then turn into settlements, uh, building a, uh, a complicated matrix of roads, uh, checkpoints, uh, barriers, uh, walls to um, to serve the settlements, continue, or, or would it be stopped? If it's in the context of a peace agreement, they will not be able to, to stop it. I'm, I'm definite about it because I think about the the context of that, the, the fact that it's going to be the final deal, people who understand this is it. And many of them will start, I mean the settlers, will start to look for new challenges for to, to do with all their energies. And some of them even started already to do it because they know that the, the big fight is lost already. However, the entry measures are very, very hard to, to pass in Israeli parliament. I'm going to quickly jump to two gentlemen here. Um, here. Pete Chatley from Brookings, a sort of a legal technical question. Have there been cases in Israeli courts where uh, this land was debated. In other words, I'm wondering, do these settlers buy the land from the Palestinian owners, or was it originally Israeli land, or how do they legally get ownership of the land, and if Palestinian owners object, what, what has been the record of Israeli courts in, in handling those disputes? Uh, Dan Rose of Internet American um, if this whole peace process collapses, as many assume that it will, um, what happens to the Palestinian leadership? I know that Abu Mazen has said on several occasions that he will step down, will 
uh, Bargudi, will Marwan Bargudi take over, or will Hamas take over the West Bank? What, what is the scenario? I'm going to come down to the corner here. I have a completely different issue. <laughs> um, as a matter of, of housing policy, it seems to me that the housing ministry has done an excellent job of creating this image that the settlements are affordable housing. And so they attract huge numbers of people who are seeking to relieve the extremely high housing costs in Israel proper. Of course, it isn't cheap because the government is subsidizing it. And that gets back to the economic issue that was raised earlier. Um, it costs the government an enormous amount of money to essentially subsidize this housing. The government could, if it wanted to, convert that policy into Israel proper to create housing settlements within Israel, particularly the Negev, and to restructure the whole way in which housing is perceived by the Israeli populace. And I think there's one last question here, sir. So we are in Lake Nilakani. I'm a member of the Middle East Institute. Uh, the Palestinians keep bringing up the right, the right of return, and that supply in the ointment. It's not a simple land for peace type of deal. I think they keep bringing up the uh, right of return. Is that a, a perpetual stumbling block, or are they? Do you get the sense they might compromise on that? And the other thing is, is there a peace movement on the Palestinian side, like like peace now on the Palestinian side, because there's a crisis of confidence between the two sides, and uh, it doesn't matter what kind of physical deal is, it's not a mechanistic thing, like there used to, well, Palestinians used to work in Israel on the farms and all in the 70s and stuff. Yeah. Today they don't do that at all, and so consequently there's a real crisis of confidence, and uh, if there was a peace movement like a Mandela or a Martin Luther King type of movement on the Palestinian side, I think it would earn the uh, respect and confidence of the Israelis, and I don't see any signs of that. Um, in your day-to-day -day dealings with the Palestinians, maybe you have a better sense for that. There are peace movements in the Palestinian side. There have always been. There, it's hard times for all peace camps, also for Israelis, but especially on the Palestinians with whole different circumstances. And as I said, I think I said it here before, a bomb in, in a street is much, much stronger than any riot of, or pictures of children shaking hands or any other activities that uh, the peace movements, uh, the Palestinian peace movement would do, will have the impression of, of one bomb. So it was always a question, where is the peace, Palestinian camp, peace camp? It is there, but it, it's hard. It's hard to, to bring in, uh, there's only any, they have a lot of pressures. And there's maybe connecting to your question about what would be if the peace process collapse. I don't want to be so pessimistic in this talk. Uh, I really don't want to talk about it um, because I, I think it, it could be horrible. Uh, the Palestinians, although there is a, a important phrase in Arabic saying that you have to be patient, Allahumma sabirin, you how, much, how many years can you wait? And how many talks can you do with those Israelis? It doesn't work. The, and the weapon does work because Israel is, 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 uh, is, for instance, went unilaterally from Gaza. So they're getting weaker and weaker. And I don't know if we're going to have a, a partner. And there are many, many Palestinians that I meet that say, Forget the two-state solution. Forget the independent Palestinian state. We want equality. We want uh, to be democratic like you Israelis. You want to control the land? OK, keep all the settlers. Give us civil rights. And we will have this fantasy of one-state solution, and everybody is happy. 
but I think it's devastating, not only from a, a Israeli Jewish Zionist perspective, but I think the road to this one national, st uh, two, two national state uh, will be with a lot of blood because the Israelis are not going to give up on the Zionist dream of the idea of having a Jewish state just like that. And it's going to take horrible years of, of, of fighting that will make us so weak, make us Israelis and also the Palestinians, that the, the economy will, will collapse because of the international pressure, because of the, the terror, because of everything. And people who has the capability will leave Israel and the people who will stay to have the two-state solution will be the most extremist and the most poor. It really sounds very bad. Um, so, and also another thing, the fact that we think that if we attack Hamas and this will undermine Hamas doesn't mean that we make the Palestinians more supportive of a peace agreement. They have another movement that are more radical than Hamas, that are being more and more supported. Uh, ideas like Al-Qaeda is being heard in the Palestinian street, streets. There is a movement that was from the 50s in the Palestinians, but was never daring to have riots in the streets, Hizb uh, al-Takhrir, which is fundamental uh, Muslim, and now they have they have riots. They they have supporters. It's developments that are, could be very very problematic. Uh, yes, there is opportunities to build in Israel. The Ministry of Housing did it in small scale. It's possible. I I really hope that they will do it. I mean, uh, um, as for the legal question on on the status of the land. It's a complicated issue. Um, I will refer you to several uh, reports that Peace Now did on, on our website that you could uh, download. In principle, Israel used an Ottoman law from the 19th century that said that the Ottoman Empire can take land, if even if it's, if it's owned by private people, as long as they don't use it for three years in a row. So it could be property of the Sultan of the empire. And Israel used this law and actually went in the beginning of the 80s all around the West Bank and found those places where the land is not used and declared state land. So we have thousands of dunams that are declared a state land according to this law. So according to Israel, it's state property, and state property could be given to the public, and the public in this case is the Israeli public of four settlements. And unfortunately, in many, too many cases, Israel ignored this law and just took over land without the declaration or land that they couldn't prove that it wasn't used, used, so they they uh, they just took it over, and they also used military orders to say we need it for security needs in order to construct settlements. So, but this is really a complicated issue. But uh, I, I refer you to our website on that. Yeah, I think I have the right of return, but this is a whole different. Uh, uh, issue that I, I I think that it's uh, I I believe yes it's possible we have the Geneva Initiative Daniel knows it the best and there and it's actually the parameters set by President Clinton uh, in the Clinton plan in December 2000 not return physical return with no limit to Israel however compensation. Mm -hmm and rehabilitation for all refugees, including some 
uh, with some people that will be uh, returning to Israel. To, to, to thank you all for those um, questions and for, for staying with us through this lunchtime event. Um, I, I, I agree that there are worse options than, um, than Hamas, and I don't think this is good news or something to wish for, but maybe, maybe there's a godfather logic that applies here, that one has to fear the other side in order to respect them and have a serious negotiation. I think there's a degree of mutual respect that no longer exists. And part of it is born from, uh, from, from, from there being no fear. I'm not keen on the fact that, that, that Hamas would be part of a process, but I do think that there may be a godfather logic that plays into uh, and is relevant to what would actually constitute a worthwhile negotiation at this stage. And, and to say something positive uh, at, at, at the end of all that, and I think Khagid has given us a, a, a huge amount of, uh, of information um, and a background explanation and analysis of, of, of that information. We, we, we mentioned the separation barrier in passing. There's a lot of negative that goes with that. There's a flip side to that, which probably isn't worth all the negative, but is worth remembering, which is the spatial map that that creates in Israeli minds. And I think just as Hagid explained to us how Israelis don't really see the difference between the West Bank and, and, and don't see a green line, I think in, in people's the cognitive maps that people carry around with them, increasingly the separation barrier will create that distinction. And I can't see the settlements that are on the other side, which doesn't mean that this is a solution, but I think it's part of the new reality, is that the se settlements on the other side, I think, will, will, will dry up. The challenge, of course, is as, as, as I think will inexorably happen, that Israel will w withdraw from those areas on the other side. Does Israel do that in the context of land for peace and security? Which I think you could get with a reconstituted, unified Palestinian national leadership. Is it land, not for peace and security, but land for security, which I actually think one could do with Hamas? Or is it land for nothing, which one did in Gaza? Um, unfortunately, the latter option seems the most likely uh, at the moment. But I think that's, that's part of a reality. And I think there is a question for, for, for the US. Um, I think, in a way, an American administration is, finds it easier, if I can use that word very use loosely, to deal with a, a more right-wing Israeli administration that is not making the right noises about a peace process. When Shamir and Netanyahu were in office, there was more of a push on some of these issues and on settlements. I mean, people remember the response to Shamir settlement expansion with the loan guarantees in 91, 92. People remember the Clinton administration carrying Netanyahu, not literally, but as good as kicking and screaming to Y River. And, the, and, and one could follow that, that policy. It's these kind of hybrid Israeli administrations which speak the language of peace but are doing the opposite on the ground. Not because they don't necessarily want to pursue a peace option, that I think, and that's where we are today, that I think an administration finds most difficult to deal with. And, and, I, and I think that an administration simply has to ask itself the question, you know, do we have uh, a partner here on the Israeli side that we can really carry through to the finish line? And I'd almost say the test should be the, the Warren Christopher Rubin test from Syria in the mid-90s. Will, will you give us a deposit? I think the conversation with the Israeli side is, will you give us a deposit that gives us the serious parameters for permanent status? And we then can either deliver the other side, Palestinian, or a broader other side, mm -hmm. international community and Arab states to make up the, the, the flip side to that. If you can't get that deposit from the Israeli side on the Palestinian issue, it may be worth focusing back on these issues and saying, okay, you're not ready, let's focus on not doing harm until you are ready. And, and I, I think we've got to the place where that whole strategy has to be re rethought because it's not worked now for several years, and in many cases more than that. But I'm, I'm further extending your stay here, and the reason I really stood up here 
was to, to thank Ambassador Phil Wilcox and the Foundation for Middle East Peace for joining us with the New America Foundation, America Strategy Program for this lunchtime session. And most of all, uh, let's say how fantastic it is to, uh, to, to be able to have hosted you here. Um, Chagit, Chagit is, um, is, is a remarkable person. She has, is, is respected and known in so many uh, places and quarters in Israel. Uh, her name is a name you'll hear in the future. Uh, those of you who follow affairs in Israel, I can guarantee you. And, and she's just one of the smartest and most talented people that I had the pleasure to work with in the past in Israel. So it's, it's really great for me to have you here, Hagin. Thanks so much.